Uh, I want to uh, tell the story of John Huss very briefly, of course. And there's another name which really belongs on there, and it is a, a gentleman by the name of Jerome, who was an associate of John Huss. Uh, you can find this chapter in the great controversy, Huss and Jerome, and uh, it's very, 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 very inspiring, uh, and I just pray that uh, I can do it justice. Um, but this big book you see me holding here, uh, this is Fox's Book of Martyrs. It was written by a man called John Fox, who was... Um, became a Protestant. He was born in 1516, and he wrote Fox's, or began Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, the first time it was published was in, uh, let me get the date right, 1563. It was actually three volumes. Uh, this was gifted to me a few years ago, and from what I can see, this, uh, there's two volumes in here. But my guess is, as I've done some research, I think this one was printed about late 1700s, so it's quite, a, quite an interesting book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's the history of martyrs who stood for truth for this word in Western Europe, and John Fox especially focuses on the ones in England because he was obviously from England, but it's an inspiration. We see people whose names we've never heard of, but they're written in heaven. They were champions of truth, and they gave their lives to stand against that powerful force which we call the Roman papacy throughout the Dark Ages. Now, the stories in this book, they focus around the 14th, 15th century, you understand. Today, I want to offer a tribute to two of them. Uh, two that are not in this book because they came before John Fox actually wrote the book, but the two I want to speak about are John Huss and uh, Jerome. Uh, John Huss was born in um, Eastern Europe. He was born in uh, 1316. Uh, today, the place was called Bohemia. Today, we'd call it the Czech Republic. Uh, John Huss's father died when he was just a little boy, and he was raised by his mother, who was a very, very godly woman. Uh, John Huss was a bright and intelligent child. And though without wealth, he was accepted as a charity student at the University of Prague. Uh, so he, he sets off to go to Prague, and his mother is with him. And as they get to the close to the entrance of that town, that godly woman, she said, son, I need to pray with you. And that dear woman knelt down with her dear son, John, and she prayed that God would bless him protect him, and use him. And that dear godly woman had no idea that one day her dear boy would have his name indeed written in heaven, but leave a record behind of this, in this world, who, of one who was truly a champion for his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the Word of God. And as, he, as uh, Joshua read this morning, those who stood upon this word, many, that they, they counted their lives not even dear unto death. That mother had no idea that that would be her son's uh, final end in this life. And, uh, but praise the Lord, to have a boy that would lay down his life for Jesus Christ, that's worth more than anything else that any parent could ever hope for. So he goes to the University of Prague, and after completing his course, uh, he entered the priesthood, which was a common thing in those days. And he rapidly rose to prominence in his country. He became attached to the court of the king, and he was also made a professor and finally the rector of the University of Prague, where he got his education. In just a few years, this humble charity scholar became the pride of his country and his name was, became renowned throughout the whole of Europe. But it was another, in another area where John Huss really made his mark, and that was again, and I repeat myself here, became a champion for this word and for the reforms that he saw needed to take place within the Catholic Church and its beliefs theologically and its practices he made a small dent 
but he made a dent not, nonetheless. He made a little crack in the dam, but others who followed that crack got wider and weaker till finally the Reformation came rolling in during the time of Martin Luther about 100 years later. But that's a point we'll look at uh, another time. But several years after taking the priest's orders and receiving his ordination, uh, John, John Huss was appointed preacher of a very important and well-known church there in Prague. It was called the Bethlehem Chapel. And it was a chapel with a difference because the, the person who founded this chapel uh, stipulated that in the Bethlehem Chapel, the Word of God would be read in the common language of the common people. Now, to make, a, to, make a, to make a claim like that, to make a stand like that in those days against the Catholic Church was asking for trouble. But nonetheless, even though we can be sure the papacy tried, they were not successful in undermining what this founder of the chapel had stipulated. So praise God, even in that dark place, the Word of God was preached in its simplicity in a language that the common people can understand. So Huss did the same thing. He preached the Word of God, the Word of God in the common tongue of the people. Doubtless he had to translate it from the Latin. It was mostly in Latin at that time. But that's what he did. But nonetheless, even though he preached the Word of God straight from the Word in the language of the common people, he realized there was a great influence, sorry, a great ignorance still regarding Bible truth. He looked around, sin and vice and immorality just prevailed everywhere. And in all, in all echelons of society, it's with the good reason they called it the Dark Ages. But appealing to the Word of God... John Huss unsparingly denounced the sins of the age and uplifted the Bible as God's standard of purity and righteousness. And by the way, it still is. Can you say amen to that? He appealed to God's Word. Now, after a while, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned Jerome. There was another scholar joined him, just a brilliant scholar by the name, simply the name of Jerome. He was also an eloquent speaker. And he complimented John Huss's ministry just tremendously. Now, here, here's, here's something new that comes into the picture here. Jerome had spent some time in England and had brought back with him the writings of a man called John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was born in 1330, a little town not far from my hometown of York, Richmond in Yorkshire, or somewhere close to there. But John Wycliffe, you may have heard the term morning star of the Reformation. John Wycliffe was nearly about 150 years before Martin Luther. He was the morning star. He too looked in the Word of God and he realized that the church that was in control, the Roman papacy, things were very, very wrong. And so he began to advocate reforms. Now he met with a lot of flack, as you can imagine. But he trained these lay preachers called Lollards, and he sent them out across England. And they were there. They were chipping away, and they were sowing the seeds of truth. But that, that, that was John Wycliffe. And so he wrote many writings. He had a lot of writings. He was not burned at the stake. He finally died. But some years after, just to get vengeance upon him by order of the papacy, his bones were dug up. They were boned, uh, sorry, they were burned to a, to a dust and thrown in the river Avon. But I think it's in great controversy, it's been written that those, the ashes of John Wycliffe went into the river, went out to the sea, and still have their effect even today. So, here we have Jerome there. He's been to England and he's brought back the writings of John Wycliffe. Now, bear in mind at this time, the Queen of England, who married the English king, she was also a Bohemian princess. And she had, she had embraced the writings of John Wycliffe. So here's a connection here between Wycliffe and Bohemia, where Huss lived, thanks to Jerome, who'd been there. Now, a lot of young men in Bohemia, they, they, they loved their princess, who'd marry the English king. So they went over to England, to Oxford, to study there, and they too were exposed to the writings and the teachings of John Huss. And under the, inf uh, sorry, of John Wycliffe. 
So under the influence of Whitcliffe, John Huss now finds himself engrossed, just taken up with the writings of this very early reformer. And he regarded the man's reforms written uh, with very high regard. Now also, so this was having an effect upon John Huss. Also at this time, two men also from, I guess the English are troublemakers once in a while, but two men from England, they went over to Bohemia and in the town of Prague, they too, they must have been influenced by Wycliffe, they started preaching these radical new things. Well, the church jumped on them and silenced them. I don't think they were put to death, but they made them be quiet. So what did these Englishmen do? They went down to the town square in Prague and I don't know if it was on the pavement or what, or on a wall, but they, they drew, they painted two pictures. One picture was a picture of the humble and meek Jesus, the Son of God, who was supposed to be the foundation of the church of Christ upon this earth. Here he is, just this humble, humble looking being, travel worn clothes with his disciple, riding on this lowly little ass into Jerusalem. It was just a picture, uh, humanly, of poverty, but of meekness and of true righteousness and of purity. But next to that, there was another picture. And here was the head of the church of Jesus Christ on earth, the Pope himself. And there he is in the other picture, riding on a beautiful steed, and he's got a beautiful crown on, and he's surrounded by all these dignitaries in all their gorgeous array, and the contrast was like night and day. As the people of Prague came by and looked at this silent witness, it spoke to them. And John Huss saw it as well, and it spoke to him also. So this compounded the things that were in his mind and his heart, which John Wycliffe had written. But this attracted attention, the contrast between the humble Jesus and the haughty, uh, professed leader of his earthly church. So what did this do to Huss? Well, he got back into the pulpit at the Bethlehem Chapel with the word of God, and with Latin or not, he spoke it in the language of the common people. And he was just having a, a, a tremendous influence, as you could imagine. Now, there were some of the forms he hadn't fully accepted, but that would be coming. But he, he denounced with even greater zeal the, the, the failings, uh, the pride, the ambition, the corruption in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Now, uh, it was, over a hundred, it was over, well over a hundred years later that Martin Luther himself, as a lowly monk, he actually took a pilgrimage to Rome itself. Huss never went to Rome, but Luther did, and you can read this in Great Controversy. And when Luther got to Rome, he expected to see, you know, th this is the headquarters of, of the church, of his leadership, and he was just aghast. Luther was aghast as he witnessed himself the debauchery, the open vileness, the, the, the immorality, especially of the hierarchy. And imagine here he is, he's, you know, he's, he's a young man still and he's, he's naive and he's idealistic and so you should be. Never lose your youthful idealistic when it comes to being a simple but courageous Christian for Jesus Christ. Never, never lose that, friends. Never lose it. And so this had an effect on, on Luther, but that, that's another story, okay? So here we go. Uh, 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 so the tidings reached Rome that this, that this uh, reformer, this John Huss, is preaching in the Bethlehem chapel things which are against the state church, the established church. Well, that would never do, you see. So before we know it, there was an appeal. There was a summons for John Huss to go before the headquarters of the church. I forget where it actually was. It wouldn't be at Rome. It would be somewhere maybe in uh, Germany or somewhere. But he had to go to the headquarters of the church to give an account for his actions. Now for him to go would have been exposing himself to uncertain death. And the king and queen of Bohemia said, 
Huss, you just can't do this. It's not safe to do. Why don't you send somebody to represent you? So that, that's what he did. He wasn't cowardly. He was just using sense. There's no point short-terming your existence. Jesus did that. He could have been killed many times had he been reckless. He says, my hour has not yet come. So it made sense. So he answered by a representative. But impatient to deal with us, the church council just went ahead. They tried him in his absence and they found him guilty and condemned him. Not only that, but the city of Prague was placed under interdict. What is an interdict? An interdict is when when from the headquarters of the church, word comes down, you're all under interdict. That means we've, clo we've just closed the gates of heaven to you. If you want to get married, your marriage cannot be solemnized. If you die, you cannot be buried in the hallowed grounds of the church. But even worse than that, if you're under interdict, the mass was withheld from you. And... By the way, I'm not mocking Catholics. Trust me, there's going to be a lot of Catholics who are going to be giving the third angel's message in the very end of time. God has his true people in there, so I'm not down on Catholic people, not by any means. In fact, there's going to be some Catholic people who are going to replace a lot of Seventh-day Adventists in the end that just go out because for one reason or another, they just really can't be bothered with this book. They've got their own gospel and it just doesn't wear when it comes to where the rubber meets the road. But that's another story. So I'm not down on Catholics, but nonetheless, I'm looking at this frame of mind here that a lot of these people, a lot of these people were in. So the interdict comes down, so you can't have mass. And you can't have mass, you can't be absolved from your sins. So that's an awful lot of leverage that the, that the medieval church could have over the minds of men and women, kings of Europe, they would bow before the Pope because he had, the, he, had the, he had that leverage. Whether you're a king or not, I can close the gates of paradise to you. So what are you going to do? Whatever you say, whatever you say. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Anyway, so Prague was placed under, under interdict. And thus by measures that appealed to the imagination which took advantage of the people's ignorance on Scripture because it says in here, who are we saved by? We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. You have to remember at that time, there were certain intermediaries you had to go through. You had to go through an earthly priesthood. Uh, it says in Timothy, for there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's why Protestantism was jealous. It's like the dawning of a new day. You don't have to go through the priest. You can come yourself upon your knees and pray to Jesus. He's your priest. Amen. Praise God. But at this time, whew, that was kind of something else. So people thought, if, if I can't have mass, what's going to happen to me? Well, so the church appealed to the ignorance of people. And this, this controlled their consciences. So plague was not plague, sorry, Prague, Prague rather, was filled with a tumult. There was a lot of angry people they didn't understand. Who started all this? We're under interdict. John Huss. So they were after his blood. So he, he decided he, he pulled out. And he went back to his uh, native village and he hung out there for a while, but he wasn't sitting at home with his mama doing nothing. John Huss was traveling around to little towns and villages and he was preaching those truths that the Lord was revealing to him. And he, eager, crowd, eager crowds would come uh, and listen to him. So um, although the tr church tried to suppress him, they could not. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, 8, we could do nothing against the truth but for the truth. And by the way, this book, uh, the street in London where this book, I, I found this out at least, was Paternoster Row. It's, it was an old street where there were bookstores, and during the Second World War, it was just obliterated by German bombers, real close to St. Paul's Cathedral. Paternoster Row and churches and streets related to it. thousands of beautiful antique books just burned up. And afterwards, as some people were kicking through the rubble, all the buildings were down, but there was a stone. There was a stone still there standing from the very street where this book was published. And there was a statement in Latin. It says, you cannot destroy the word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord, you know. 
That's, an, that's just a little something else for you to think about there. But it's true. You, you try and oppose Jesus, you're wasting your time. But there's been a lot of people who've wasted their time over the years because sometimes people they just never learn. And there's going to be people at the end who are going to waste their time again and they'll never learn till it's too late. But we won't waste our time, right? We will not waste our time? No, certainly not. All right, so here we are. So the mind of Huss. Huss is going through a quandary at this time um, because, well, let me explain it. Uh, there was a painful conflict going on in his mind. He, he found these truths, and he was getting in trouble with the church. And although he was differing with the papacy on major points of doctrine, and, all the, uh, and although the papacy as a result was seeking to destroy him, he had not renounced the authority of the Catholic Church. To him, the papacy was still the bride of Christ, and the head priest, the Pope, was still his representative on earth. So this brought a terrible conflict uh, into John Hussey's mind. And in his heart, there was this struggle going on. For example, he would ask, he would ask himself this question. If, if the papacy is infallible, as I believe, how do I feel compelled to disobey this infallible church, because as I read, as I understand the word of God, by obeying this infallible church, I'll be sinning against God. So to obey Rome's demands would be to sin, but why would obedience to an infallible church lead to such an issue like this? Do you get it? He was trying to figure this out. Well. There was a, a well-known author called Wiley. Um, he was an English uh, historian. He wrote, wrote a great book on the Reformation and also a book on the Waldenses. And this is what Wiley wrote about John Huss, how John Huss resolved this. Um, this is Wiley, I quote, the nearest approximation to a solution which he, that is John Huss, the, near, the nearest approximation to a solution which he was able to make was that this problem, this quandary, had happened before, as once before in the days of the Savior, that the priests of the church had become wicked persons and were using their lawful authority for unlawful ends. And obviously the light went on. This led John Huss to adopt for his own guidance and to preach to others for theirs, this is it, the maxim that the precepts of scriptures convey through the understanding are to rule the conscience. In other words, that God speaking in the Bible and not the church speaking through the priesthood is the one infallible guide. Did you get that? Can you say amen then? Amen. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, that principle, by the way, still applies today, does it not? And it always will do. And if we are going to be Protestants, like the, the word Protestant wasn't even invented in this day, understand? That came a little later on during Luther's time in the protest of the princes. But if we are going to be Husses or Luthers or not big names, but just ordinary people who love Jesus and want to serve him, whatever the cost, we have got to be led by this same principle. And I kid you not, that test is going to come around again to each one of us sooner than what we realize. So, Huss goes back to uh, the Bethlehem Chapel and he starts preaching again about what is going on here. And of course, uh, he got the blame, of course. Uh, like Elijah of old, Hus was accused of being the troubler of Israel. And uh, once again, Prague was placed under interdict. Another thing I should mention at this time, there were three individuals claiming to be the Pope. Three of them, yes. Um, and each one... Okay, so, so you got three of them. One of them would say, I'm the Pope, 
and the other two, they're anti-popes. And the other one would say, no, I'm the pope, and the other two are anti-popes. And the other one would say, no, I'm the pope, and the other two are anti-popes. So we had that three, three, three men claiming to, to be the pope. So each one of these men needed to raise funds to, pray for, to pay for mercenaries, for soldiers, to fight for their cause against the other two, you see. Um, uh, and so what the church did, so what these individuals did, they started selling blessings for money. You know, here's a blessing, give me uh, shekels. And uh, that's nothing new. Uh, in fact, not to get too much off track, but in 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the door of the church in Wittenberg, his main beef that he was contending with was the sale of indulgences, which is pretty much the same. In other words, you pay for an indulgence, you pay for your sin, you can pay and have your sins absolved. You can pay and, uh, you know, you'll be in good shape with God. So here was something that was very, very similar. So he did not like the idea of this, rightly so. And so he preached again. And, and so for the second time, Prague was placed under interdict. So what did Hus do? He left, never to return to the Bethlehem Chapel. He didn't come back. But nonetheless, at the same time, thereabouts, the church called a, ba a major church council in the town of Constance. And the chief objective of this, remember there's three popes contending to be popes and other stuff going on. The chief object of this, of this church council meeting here was to heal the divisions in the church and root out heresy. Those striving for the leadership of the church were expected to be present, and so was John Huss, who was the leader, the propagator of the new opinions. He was expected to be there as well. Now, Huss was promised a safe conduct to Constance and back, but he knew he was still uh, risking his life if he was gonna do that. But nonetheless, he went to Constance, he was taken, and he was thrown into a filthy dungeon. Now, back in his home country of Bohemia, there was an uproar. Huss was given a safe passage to Constance and back. What happened? Well, the reply they got back from the papacy is this, and I quote from another historian, uh, Jacques Lafont. Uh, the answer was this from the church. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics, nor persons suspected of heresy.